Yeah, so I think we can start. So a uh, bit uh, quick announcement. So if you haven't subscribed yet to the uh, mailing list, so I have sent an email on the chat. Uh, I have sent the link on the chat. Please subscribe because we are making we are using that list for <coughs> doing the talk announcement. Secondly, I will share a feedback form. Uh, the feedback form will have two uh, sub kind of sections, which where one is about the feedback to the speaker about the talk and gen just about the general conduct of the seminar or you want to have something extra or you want to have something which it doesn't good feel bad or some something could feel better so that we can make the seminar better next time uh, nothing else so oh, i'm happy to introduce uh, these are the two announcements so i'm very happy to introduce nitish uh, gupta he's a phd student at uh, university of pennsylvania and she's advised uh, he's advised by professor dan roth and co-advised by samir singh from uca and his research focus on developing structured model for grounded language understanding. Um, he will talk about all these things in today's talk. So uh, let's give uh, Nitish more chance to talk rather than me. So Nitish, you can start. Thanks. Yeah. Um, thank you for having me. Um, today I will talk about two works, uh, mainly neural module networks for reasoning over text. Um, so this is a paper in iClear. 2020 this year, and then I will talk about uh, some recent ACL work. Um, so to start, I will give a quick introduction of uh, why question answering as a format is important to study in natural language processing. Um, so question answering is a very innate way in which humans uh, fill their information needs. So we would want our machines um, uh, to be able to answer questions. Also, as a format, it is very interesting uh, because it helps us probe a system's understanding of any context, uh, which can be say an image, uh, a body of text, or or some video. And then you can also uh, query about diverse reasoning phenomena, whether this model is able to solve them or not. So, for example, is this model understand coreference or causality or predicate argument structure and stuff like this? Um, so, I will first begin with what kind of question answering problems we are interested in and what are the challenges in them. I will give some background, uh, then I will talk about our work. So these are the kind of um, problems we are interested in, where we are given a question. Uh, so for example, who scored the longest touchdown pass of the game? Um, and some context, uh, which is a paragraph of text, and we're uh, supposed to make a machine that is able to answer these questions. Um, now, the as you might see, this question is quite compositional. Um, and it requires multiple steps of reasoning uh, to answer. So presumably a human would break this down into multiple steps, so such as what are the touchdown passes, find them in the paragraph, then find how long each one of them is, um, then find what is the longest one amongst them, and then finally find who scored that longest touchdown pass, and that would be the answer. Um, now, making machines like this poses several challenges. Um, so first, a model needs to understand the compositional nature of the question. So it should be able to roughly break down this question into these sub questions um, that we saw. Um, the second major challenge is uh, that the model should be able to understand the context, the paragraph um, that it is answering the question against. Um, so for example, to answer questions like what are the touchdown passes or how long each one of them is, um, the model should be able to understand this paragraph of text um, and then uh, then only will it be able to answer these sub questions. Um, and lastly, uh, the model should be able to perform reasoning, uh, which is it should be able to combine the information it has extracted in the previous sub questions and then perform some um, functions or some arithmetic over it and then uh, answer uh, questions that require reasoning. So, for example, uh, what is the longest one? Uh, to answer such a question, the model should be able to do a sorting or a max operation over the numbers it has. Um, answered for the other sub questions before. With this, I will get into the background of, of how people have looked at solving similar problems. Um, so the most widespread um, way to solve such a problem is, is have a black box neural network, which can take the question and the context as input, um, do some multi-layer uh, representation inside it, and then output the answer. Uh, now, there are several issues uh, with having a black box neural network answer questions. Um, first of all, there is significant data sparsity. Uh, so the kind of questions we are looking at are highly compositional. 
so they involve multiple subparts and we cannot expect um, that as training data, we would get all possible combinations. So the model should have some inductive bias to be able to understand this compositional nature of language and reasoning. Um, secondly, um, the decision-making process of a black box neural network uh, would be non-interpretable. We would not be able to see why the model gave a particular answer. And if it gave an incorrect answer, we won't know why it does so. Um, and lastly, there is no modularity um, in black box neural networks. Like there are no independent modular components that you can uh, tease apart, uh, which have certain skills and then use them to do to solve other reasoning challenges or other related reasoning challenges. Uh, the black box neural network can only be used in this end to end manner to solve the problem that you trained it for. The other related work uh, that people have looked on for the longest time is semantic parsing, uh, where the idea is you get this compositional natural language utterance and you map this to a formal uh, meaning representation. So here it is, for example, mapped into this SQL query, um, which can be executed against some structured knowledge base uh, to get the answer. So here you have a database and this utterance gets mapped into this SQL query, which can be executed against this database to get the answer. Now, one issue with applying this technique to our work or, or to our problem is that we are dealing with unstructured uh, data, which is uh, unstructured context, which is paragraphs. Um, so we don't know how to execute uh, these structured representations over unstructured uh, context. So we'll look at how a model does that. So with this, I get into um, our model of how what we define. Uh, one quick thing, if you have any questions at any point, uh, feel free to interrupt me and, and ask any questions you have. Okay, so the approach uh, we define, the neural model network for reasoning over text, um, is an end-to-end -end neurosymbolic approach uh, for question answering. Um, it has um, interpretable decision-making and it is compositional and modular in nature. And I will go into how our model satisfies all these uh, properties. So as step one, very similar to uh, semantic parsing, our model also parses the question into this, um, into some kind of a formal meaning representation, which is a program. So here, um, this gets mapped into this program you see, and the functions within this program roughly correspond to the sub questions we saw initially, is, is the kind of sub questions that a human would, for example, break this question down into. Um, now, the second part, which is the crucial part, is, is how do we execute this program um, against the paragraph that we have? Um, now, what this would mean uh, is that you should be able to execute functions like this. Uh, like you should be able to execute a find function, um, which has this argument touchdown pass and rela uh, reliably output all the spans in that piece of text which are touchdown passes. Now, we cannot write a conventional... Uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, so sure. Do, do you define this program initially? Like uh, these gen... So these program need to be somewhat generic if you define them initially. Like how do you come with these program at the first place? Like what program should be there? Like max num, find num, find... So like those things. are those are not programs. Those are functions. Yeah, and functions. So these functions we predefined. Yes, we predefined a set of functions. Okay. And they are lit generic so that they can work on a large set of questions kind of. Yes. And you cannot make a comprehensive list of functions, but yeah, yeah uh, it is, it is, it is, uh, they're defined so that they can perform a wide variety of reasoning tasks. Okay. okay. And so I will, I will, and, and this process of converting the question into this program, uh, is learned. I will get into that, uh, in a while. Yeah. Okay. So I think, I think you probably addressed it slightly. So, so these these functions themselves they take a natural language sentence and sort of work on that right um uh, yes and no uh, internally they they take attention over the question okay yeah as in those are details but yeah they they too take some sub part of the question and then and then uh, output whatever relevant output they have sure sure thanks okay okay cool so Right. So, right. So to execute functions like this, um, 
we, we will not be able to write a conventional program. So for example, you cannot write a Python function to, to do this, uh, which would generalize reliably. Uh, so the idea that neural model networks presented was why don't we learn these functions? Um, so these functions um, are called neural modules. Uh, they are neural network parameterizations, uh, which solve like very primitive tasks. So for example, this find module here uh, will get a string as input, um, some argument and a passage of text, and then will output whatever instantiations there are of that string um, or, or similar events or entities in that, in that passage of text. Um, okay, so I will give you a high level overview of, of how our model works is we get a question and in step one, um, this question gets paused into this, this program, this abstract program that the model needs to execute to get the answer. This question parser is, is jointly learned. Um, and in the second step, this program gets executed um, against the paragraph um, to get the answer. I will, I will quickly go into, into how this execution would actually work. So to execute this program, the, the model will first execute this function find uh, which is, as I said, a learnable module. And for example, it outputs all these pans of text um, as its output. And next, this find number module would get executed. And this, this should presumably perform some information extraction to, to get the answer, to get the numbers associated with the spans that were highlighted in the previous step. Next, um, this max number module uh, should be able to do this discrete reasoning step of finding the maximum number amongst the ones that were uh, that it got as input from the previous step. And here say that is 39. And what we would want to do is to be able to do this discrete reasoning operation in a differentiable manner uh, to propagate gradients efficiently. And then lastly, this extract argument would extract the who scored argument associated with that event that was highlighted in the previous step. So here the answer is, for example, Jay Cutler. Um, any questions at this point? Uh, okay, so so you said you you learn all of this in a end-to-end -end fashion, right? Mm -hmm. So and you have these predefined templates for these these questions, right? Uh, what do you mean by the predefined I mean, template? I mean, so you have you have you'll define the functions such as find find num max num beforehand. Right. Right. So. Uh, so is there any supervision required for this question parser or just it, it learns from scratch? Uh, uh, no, we did. I will, I will go into it slightly, but yeah, we did find that question parsing is quite difficult. Uh, so we did supervise uh, these programs for around 10% of our training data. Okay. I see. I see. Okay, cool. Thanks. Right. Thank you. Um, any other questions? So, but uh, these in the end, like these program are connected to each other. And I'm assuming that each of these program has some neural components. So these are like each module of neural, like neural module. And you are saying you just use 10% of the data to train each module and then you do everything unsupervised. Am I right? No, uh, okay. we, we get 10% uh, of the questions have the okay. program uh, annotated. Okay, ten. okay. okay. And each of these are somewhat neural modules, like there are neural component involved in them. Like, right. The modules, modules have some, they have some parameterization internally. Okay. And they are joined end to end, like a representation of one will feed into other. Yes, or... exactly. So like, like a regular okay. program would do. So, okay, cool. so like in exactly in this case, uh, when you look at this program, yes, to execute this program, you will go in a bottom up manner, right? Yes. So the find function will first execute. Yes. Um, its output will be fed into the find number module. Okay. Uh, then its output will be fed into this max number module. And finally okay. the output will be fed into this extract num argument module and whatever okay. the output of that is, is the answer to this question. Okay. And I think you are doing with distributions rather than like X discrete outputs to make the right. propagation. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thanks. So Thanks. yeah, so I will not go into those details because yeah. they're cumbersome, but yeah. Yeah, because to maintain end-to-end -end differentiability, uh, yes. nothing in this is discrete internally. Okay. Uh, cool. So the output of a find is not discrete spans, some but some distribution over tokens and spans. Uh, okay. Similarly, numbers are distribution over numbers, 
and then this module would do a max operation in a differentiable manner. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So I have another question regarding. Uh, I so I think I remember from Berkeley's Vision Group they had some paper I think two three years ago regarding neural module networks. I think so. They right, that is the first work. Yeah, from Jacob okay. Andreas. Okay. Okay. Sure. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Exactly. So that is why we call it exactly neural module networks for reason because it um, directly develops over that work. Okay. Okay. Good. I see. Thanks. Uh. Okay, I will, I will kind of give a overview of, of what the modules we define uh, in our work. So as I said, these modules are basically functions um, that perform primitive natural language or symbolic reasoning tasks. And these are designed uh, to work in a probabilistic manner um, and they're, they're differentiable in nature so that they can propagate gradients. So, so for the natural language reasoning part, we define modules such as find which would find or ground some span of question in the uh, some span from the question into the paragraph. There are filter module, which would filter out certain spans from the passage according to some condition. Extract argument would, would idly perform some kind of a predicate argument structure extraction and then output whatever the argument that was asked for. Find number and date are again information extraction um, style modules that would answer that would output numbers and dates. And on the symbolic reasoning side, we have modules such as count, which can count um, the num like the number of spans that are highlighted or a max min number that can do some kind of max min operation um, and comparison modules that can compare numbers or dates. So just to give you an example, um, a find module could, for example, uh, get a distribution over question tokens to maintain differentiability. But in this case, it gets, it gets attention over field goals. Um, and then the output would be some distribution over passage tokens um, that would highlight the field goal events in this passage. So this is where the probabilistic nature comes in. So these are all distributions uh, over tokens and, and nothing is discrete uh, in how these modules operate. Uh, similarly, a fine number module uh, would get, for example, a distribution over passage tokens as inputs and would output a distribution over numbers in that passage. So here the module, for example, outputs equal probabilities on the numbers 39, 44, and 42, um, which is the output of this fine number module. Uh, now these both modules um, are, are learnable. So they have parameters in, inside them that, 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 uh, that make this module do this conversion. Um, but then there are discrete mo uh, reasoning modules that don't have parameters in them, but uh, we find an analytical formulation to do this max operation in a differentiable manner. So what it would, for example, get as input is, is a distribution over numbers. In this case, for example, it has equal probabilities on 22, three and 15, and it would output a distribution over the max of this set. And for example, it will have the highest probability on 22. And, and this differentiable nature will help us propagate gradients in an end-to-end -end manner. Okay, so with this, I would go into um, the learning challenges that are present um, I, that, that, that such a model proposes. Yeah. I, I, I got a question, sorry. Uh, if you go back to uh, the previous two slides. Uh, um, this one? Uh, the, the, the previous one. Okay. Yeah, this one. Uh, so I just, uh, I'm just curious if there is a, a kind of a constraint on the span prediction on, on, on the different uh, functions, like uh, like uh, you first find there is a 39 yard and there is a 44 yard, and then mm -hmm. the fine number. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm assuming the fine number is taking a span of text and, and find the, what are the answers for this function, right? And uh, so is there a constraint between the uh, the uh, the predictive span inside of this function and outside of this function, uh, like uh, like you first find the number and then you're taking this span and then and and what is whatever is uh, the outside function of this whatever function is taking the uh, output of this fine number function and there is another span right? Um, uh, no, so the modules. Uh, operations are not dependent on the program. So they work independently. I see. Okay. So this is a function that would get some distribution over tokens as input. 
and output some distribution over numbers. It, it doesn't matter where it got the input from or where this, its output is going to. Okay, so it's basically taking all the paragraph as input all, all the time. Yes, right? it, it is okay. taking the whole paragraph as input, but it gets highlights, like some distribution over tokens for which it has to find numbers. Got, got, so, for thanks. example, if you look in the second sentence, there's 43 yard field goal. Um, because that is not, as in those tokens are not attended to, the module will not output 43 as one of its numbers. Okay, I see. Is, is that clear? Does it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. No worries. Um, okay, so learning challenges. So, what do we get as supervision? is say only questions and answers. Um, and we have devised all this mechanism that first this question will get paused into this discrete program. And then this program will get executed against the paragraph to answer. And there are parameters in both of them. The question parser has parameters and the executor, basically the modules inside this have parameters. And we need to learn all of this from back propagation and all, all these internal um, decisions of the model are latent. Um, but what, um, what we get, uh, as, as a, as an advantage of, of doing this decomposition is that we can supervise intermediate decisions of the model. So as I alluded to before, um, we get supervision for around 10% of the questions and we can, uh, we can, we can tell the model what the goal parse is, um, for, for some given questions. And also we can go a step further. And we can also tell what the intermediate output for some functions is. So for example, when we are executing this program, we get Jay Cutler as the final answer for the, uh, for the, for the question, but you can also supervise what the output or the find number modules should be, uh, which helps us, which helps, uh, learning, uh, more. Uh, I think I have results for that, uh, later on, but, uh, so what we do is we first um, devise this unsupervised auxiliary loss, uh, which tells the find number module that given a span as input, so field goal, which is highlighted in blue over here, it, this auxiliary loss encourages the model um, to output numbers that are close to this. So like within a window, uh, such a reward, you, you, because we have decomposition, you can have such a reward on the model. Similarly, we, as I said before, we can supervise intermediate output. So we can, even if the answer is J Cutler, we can say that the output of fine number internally should have all these numbers that are in purple highlighted. Uh, putting it all together, this is one of the examples. Uh, this is one of the outputs from our model. So the question was who kicked the longest field goal in the second quarter? Um, the, uh, the model outputs this program and then it, executes it in a manner that we would actually like. And, and all of this is interpretable, uh, because of the decomposition we do. Can you explain a color coding? Like, uh, what is in the paragraph, like which module is doing what? So I think the re right. So pink, okay. yeah. Yeah. So, so from the left, so again, this is a, <coughs> this is a completely left branching, uh, tree. So we can, the, the linearization is quite easy. So the yeah. execution goes, uh, like the find module gets okay. some attention over field goal from okay. the question as input, and then okay. it grounds to field goals, which are highlighted in blue in the okay. passage. Okay. Then the filter module gets as input, some attention over in the second quarter. Okay. And the filter module internally finds all that piece of text that is highlighted in the red, starting from in the second quarter, ending in 15 yard touchdown run. Sorry. Okay. Um, yes. So it only selects field goals from that region. Okay. So the three field goals in that, in that piece are output by this, the one field okay. goal, the 48 yard field goal is left out. Okay. Then the max number module, um, first of all, internally computes the numbers and then does a max <coughs> operation and outputs the field goal, which is highlighted in green, the 45 okay. yard field goal. Okay. Okay. Because the other ones were 40, uh, 39 and 45 34. and 34. Yeah. So it outputs the, uh, the 45 yard field goal. And then the relocate, there is some, we changed the name from relocate to extract argument. Um, 
but um, so it, it get it gets as input who kicked part and then it outputs corner barth okay, uh, as the answer okay thanks okay this make overall interpretability also very good like because you know like how the whole execution is happening by looking at the intermediate steps uh, right like that was that was one <coughs> yes that was that was one key reason we chose to have such a model or work with such a model is is because we think interpretability of intermediate decisions is quite important interesting um and it helps us debug uh, if the model makes mistakes okay interesting i will Thanks. in the second work i will talk a little bit about more about interpretability okay okay uh great so so we perform experiments over this data set called discrete reasoning over paragraphs um this was presented by dhiru dua in 2019 nakal um so these are the kind of different kinds of questions that we get to see in this data set so you might have to compare dates so it asks for which event happened later a or b you might want to compare date differences or compare numbers or extract numbers uh so, uh, like the kinds we have been seeing, or you may also have to count uh, some certain number of events or entities from the piece of text. Um, so we have two variations of our model: uh, one that uses, one that learns a GRU um, jointly um, to represent text, and one which is bird-based. Um, and we compare with the state-of-the-art models, um, and we see that our model performs better in in both cases. Um, when you compare this end to end performance we also do an experiment where we limit the percentage of training data and we see how how this learning curve looks and we see that for example when to achieve 70 f1 a model requires 30% less training data and this is one of the classic arguments for for how compositionality or this modularity is helping us um bird base The, uh, this is word base yes okay and what is mtms if you know like so mtms is a is is this is this model Multi that oh okay mlp 2019 oh nice nice so this is almost <coughs> a state of the art model uh on okay. this data so it's bird with something special yes so it it is basically bird representations and then on top of it they have a very thin layer of of adding operations that are required for this data set so like addition subtraction uh and counting i think interesting okay right Thank but you. yeah so so even though the performance is quite similar uh yeah. one advantage of a model is that our decision making process is interpretable yeah yeah, yeah i agree yeah thanks okay okay so with this i will come in i'll discuss the limitations of 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 our approach um so firstly a structured parse is very restrictive is is the natural language that we have is is very continuous in its meaning and the idea that we are working with is that this can be represented in this formal meaning representation which is very discrete in nature and then you can you can hit blocks that you're not able to represent some meaning in in this discrete structure so that is one limitation of this approach the other is that it is difficult to design interpretable modules for certain tasks or or of certain reasonings so for example if you have a question which says which quarterback threw the most touchdown passes now to answer this question if you think about it you will have to first find the different quarterbacks that are mentioned in the passage and then for each one of them find what are the touchdown passes they scored so this would require some kind of a key value mapping uh to answer to to be able to represent the semantics of this token most and to do this in a differentiable manner for example is is quite difficult um and then the lastly last limitation is um our approach is incapable currently of doing context conditional parsing so by that what i mean is currently our model would get as input a question and then directly output a parse um uh, but that information that is needed or the reasoning steps that are needed to answer uh might be different depending on different paragraphs like they can present this information in different manner and our model is kind of incapable of doing that currently so i think these are limitations but also scopes for future work uh so are you saying like if i ask the question in a different way uh it might be difficult for it to pass if i 
get it no right? so okay no so for example um if you have a question which says which event happened first a or b okay and our model just looking at this question parses it into find date for event a find date for event b and then compare less than or something <laughs> yes but in the passage for example the text says event a a happened before event b just oh this. okay 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 so this would so this is con context conditional context conditional because some some other paragraph could have actually listed out dates for these two events and then this program would have been correct but given this other paragraph in which it directly says a happened before b this yes. program will not be correct okay so the reasonings which are present in some what like more common sense or like uh, i would say i don't know quantifier kind of stuff uh, i don't know quantifier what you call it but as that in, would be yeah so as in we don't know but but uh, currently our approach is a little uh, is is skewed towards trying to do this these discrete operations and stuff because that is what this data set has but if you actually go in the wild then then there are all sorts of different inferences that you have to draw okay and cool. and one of them is obviously not correct always it depends okay. on how this information is present okay uh, can you say something about the first point like structured pass is restrictive i didn't get that uh, fully right so so there are so like so what we have are these discrete functions yes and um they are not always like it is not always easy to come up with discrete functions to doing this um like people in in people who study semantics for the longest time have 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 like very typical examples of this uh so for example if i say i'm not able to come with the example right now but um so for example i think you can still mod have functions like uh, to represent things like at least and stuff but oh, but okay. they, but they they might be quite difficult to do them in a discrete manner okay okay got it sometime uh, i i have a question maybe um at what point of 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 the of this model like cor the coreference problems that the may be present in the in the paragraph are, are being uh, handled i mean i'm being yeah i'm being uh, solved uh that's a good question so currently we don't handle coreference problems um and if there are if there is so currently in this data set not a lot of questions require coreference and if they do they are like quite simple uh so a model kind of just gets away with it but it doesn't have hard coreference issues and yes okay. that that is one limitation of a model as well oh, okay but it it will be uh, interesting to see uh, at what point of of the of the model uh, even if they are very simple the system is 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 getting away to 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 the with the coreferences this is interesting yeah yeah i completely agree yep okay so i have a question regarding the regarding supervision so mm -hmm. uh, so you have these uh, modules that that address certain parts of the questions right so right. Is, it, is it possible to sort of let's say you want to do the find number something find number or find max so is it possible to supervise them with not the data that you have the currently in the in the question and that passage but separately for example you can construct certain sort of passages or you can get them from yep. wikipedia and sort of so i i think for find max find numbers and so on so these are something that you can create artificially artificially create some data for supervision yes so, yes and that is yep uh, and, and and i completely agree so that is why i like this class of models is that this decomposition helps you get supervision from from elsewhere so when i talked about this so this intermediate module output is exactly what you're talking about is we can supervise this find number module using data from yeah. somewhere else and then plug this in in this in this complex model right right so, yeah so uh, we don't do it currently but this is quite possible actually we do this slightly in the next piece of work i will quickly present okay. Okay. right so is it fair to say i have 10 more minutes is 10 more minutes okay i think i think Where, we have lost where is vivek sorry Do we got time limit on this? Yeah, yeah, at yeah, ten minutes is fine. It's no issue, no issue. Sorry, oh. I was mute. I didn't notice. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> good. Uh, okay, so 
Okay, so I will present this next piece of work, which was, uh, which is, which will be presented in ACL. Um, so I will talk about the issues with end-to-end -end learning or 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 faithfulness of interpretability. So I will give you this example on 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 visual reasoning. So for example, if you have a question which says all dogs are black and you're given this image, and the supervision you get is false. Um, now, if you have a neural module network or similar neural module network, it parses this uh, statement into a function like this, which counts the number of dogs and counts the number of black dogs and then sees whether they are equal or not. Now, the supervision you're getting is only at the very top, which is, uh, which is false in this case. And using just that supervision, you need to learn the execution of all modules inside it. So in this case, you have to learn the execution of find, filter, and counting, just using this uh, simple piece of uh, feedback. Um, now, what we see is that um, these modules don't actually perform in the way we want. So consider this uh, output where find only outputs the black dog and does not output uh, uh, in its prediction this white dog. And then filter only selects this black dog because it only got that as the input. Um, even executing, even, even with these intermediate outputs, the answer is correct. It says false with a probability of 57. But you would not trust such a model. And the execution of find is not faithful in some sense to what it should have been doing. Instead, what you would want is that um, the find should output both dogs as output, and then filter should select one of them, uh, the black one in this case. Um, so in this work, we found that uh, there is no guarantee uh, that when we are training in an end-to-end -end manner, that these modules will learn their intended reasoning. That is, uh, they are faithful to whatever they were supposed to learn. Um, so what we propose in this work is that not just to judge the final output of the uh, program, but also the intermediate output. So for example, in the top, in this visual reasoning case, you will not only output whether the model outputs true as the answer, but you would also out, you would also judge whether all the intermediate outputs, like the output of count, the output of with relation, find, etc., are correct or not. Um, similarly, in this textual reasoning case that we have been looking at, um, you would not only judge the answer, but would also judge the intermediate outputs, so like whether find outputs all the correct touchdown passes in this case that it had to output, or filter select the correct ones or not. I will not go into the details. We, we basically, we, we define metrics uh, to compare some gold outputs uh, to predicted outputs. And we hand annotate these gold outputs for around two to 300 questions. Um, and, and, uh, and we see that this end-to-end -end learning doesn't really uh, output uh, what we would want the model to output. Uh, we propose three different ways of improving this faithfulness in neural module networks. So the first is pre-training or supervising module output. So as one of you said, um, this modularity gives you this, this, um, this flexibility to pre-train or supervise modules um, independently. And this obviously really helps in, in them performing whatever reasoning you want them to perform. The second is, is the choice of their architecture that I will go into detail. And then we also have this idea of decontextualized word representation, which I will not talk about today. You can read the paper for that. Um, okay, so I'll talk about how the modular architecture affects faithfulness. So imagine um, you have this program that you have to execute and this count module is implemented as a deep feed forward neural network. Now, the feedback we would get is only at this equal node at the top. Um, and because count is an expressive feed forward neural network, it can learn to perform other operations also. So for example, it can learn to perform this filtering or finding within itself, and it would not propagate good gradients below it. Um, so, so such an expressive neural network can actually hamper uh, how, how, how learning progresses. Um, on the other hand, what we tried 
was a very simple parameterless module, uh, which we call a sum count. What, uh, what it gets as input is just probabilities for bounding boxes as input. And it naively just counts or just sums up these probabilities and outputs uh, the count value. The idea is that because it has no parameters and it is getting such a simple input, uh, such a simple measure as input, it would propagate good gradients below it uh, to other modules. But then this has one issue um, that it does not account for overlapping bounding boxes or bounding boxes that have very low probabilities. So imagine if you have 10 bounding boxes, each with very low probabilities, this sum will start amounting to a significant mass. So next, what we tried was this graph count module, uh, which we took from the literature. Uh, this is, this is an approach. This is an architecture which takes, uh, probabilities over bounding boxes as input, and it introduces minimum number of parameters to ignore overlapping or low confidence bounding boxes. Um, so it is somewhere between the feed forward neural network and this very naive sum count. And what we find is that um, going to this, to this, in the, to this uh, graph count module, the faithfulness score actually improves quite significantly. Um, so when we have this feed forward neural network, the overall faithfulness of the model, for example, is 0 0.05 going to sum count in, improves it by a lot. And then going to graph count gets us the best. And not just this, we also see that the, the outputs of all modules uh, improve just by changing the graph count module, which actually goes to show that our hypothesis is quite true that, that this module with such an inductive bias um, actually propagates good gradients below it. Um, uh, can I ask a question regarding the numbers? Sure, sure. So, so how, how do we interpret these numbers? So, so 0.32 means 32% times 32% times is, is, is it, is it faithful? Uh, not really. So, because, so we discussed this in quite a length in the paper, uh, to come up with a metric for this was quite difficult. So these are not exactly interpretable. So the, these are a mix of some F1 measure and some log scale. So it is, these are not exactly interpretable. Okay. Okay. Right. But, but then we, uh, in the paper, we do significance tests, uh, like very strict significance test to show that these are actually significantly different. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry. I think, uh, yeah, I'll point you to the paper and, uh, it has details of these metrics. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, with this, I would come to a conclusion. Um, in this, in this talk, I presented the neural module networks to answer compositional questions against text. I, we, I defined some probabilistic modules, um, to perform both natural language and symbolic reasoning, um, so that we can propagate uncertainty about intermediate decisions in a differentiable manner. Uh, then I proposed or talked about some methods to improve the execution of these modules using auxiliary losses or, or some choices in modules. And I think there are, there is a lot of interesting research possibilities, uh, to scale up, um, with this, I would like to thank all my collaborators. This has my advisors and other people who have worked on these two problems and you can find the code and a live demo of, of the previous work, the neural module networks work, uh, at this link, uh, with that I thank you. Any questions, uh, if you have. Yeah. Thanks, Nitish. Uh, if anybody has questions, they can ask now. Yeah. We can have our virtual cap clap. We cannot. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, no, no. Thanks a lot for having me. Thanks for doing that. Questions? Okay. I have a question. So, mm -hmm. so this look a very interesting work and a lot of you, as you said, feature interesting work and we build upon it. So where do you think like right now this system is lacking? So some of the things you already discussed kind of thing, and also a little bit about the practical feasibility of such system, like a uh, computation aspect, like, <clears throat> so for example, if you have a train model, like single end to end, like BERT or something, uh, people, uh, basically put the input and get the output. And I don't know whether it's doing the right thing or not, but they get it right. Like by numbers, they are doing good. 
So <clears throat> what do you think why this system will be more like useful? One is definitely the interpretability aspect and the neurosymbolic stuff. But on the other side, like where things can be improved or what's your thought on that? Like what could be done more with it? Right. So I think this, this will be a constant battle between end-to-end -end models and more structured models. And both have their use cases in different scenarios. So if you only care about numbers in some specific domain, um, and you know that your test data will come from some from the same distribution that you saw during training, then maybe end-to-end -end models are a, are a very, very good approach. But um, I didn't talk about it um, in this talk, but in the second paper, we also show that when you have more faithful execution, uh, our model generalizes in a much better manner. Interesting. So to, 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 to inputs that are not from the input distribution you saw. Okay. So in those cases, I mean, the, these are very highly, these are highly compositional problems that you're looking at. And there is, there is good reason to believe that end to end models are not answering them for the right reason. Yeah. And there have been plenty full of work that have shown that. So I think in those scenarios, um, where, where you actually care about out of domain, uh, out of distribution generalization, then such models are, are quite helpful. Uh, the other reason I like them is obviously interpretability uh, and also modularity. So as, as okay. one of you mentioned, and I am also looking at it and I'm sure other people are also that how do yes. you transfer supervision from other primitive tasks um, to here? So again, you can, there can be a, you, you can try to do those primitive tasks as pre-training objectives in, in models like Word, for example. Yes. So I think your yeah, reasoning aspect, why right, this is how human also reasons and it quite following the same line because of the modularity that is very useful. But we don't know whether it is correct or not. <laughs> Yeah, because there are all sorts of <clears throat> arguments people have made. Like, we don't know how humans reason. Um, yeah, that's also true. These can be like post hoc. <clears throat> like, there has been a lot of research in psychology that these are just post hoc explanations <clears throat> that we come up with, and we yeah. don't know exactly how yeah. to reason. But, but we but, can impose a reasoning, like what we have in mind on these like modular framework, and then we can say, okay, if these things work well, then everything should work perfect. Right, right, right. So I think. <clears throat> There is space for both kinds of models and there should be research in both kinds of yeah. models. Um, well, these, yeah. these have applicability where you really care about interpretability <laughs> and you know that there is this small class of reasoning problems you care about, but then you, then you want very good out of domain, out of distribution generalization, for example, and stuff like that. Then, then these models are very helpful, I think. Yeah. And it will be interesting. How can we even use this to improve the end to end map blocks if possible? Like, is there any way we can get things like the interpretal aspect from it and then somehow seamlessly embed that in the pre-train, like the final model, which we have in the end. Uh, right. Anyway, yeah. there are many interesting things, you know. Oh, anyway. Yeah. I, I yeah, asking I, I, too I, many I, questions. Oh. Other people, <laughs> if they have any questions. Uh, uh, so, so how many, how many modules do you have? How many diff these compositional modules do you have? Uh, if I remember correctly, we had around 13 or 14 in our paper currently. Okay. 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 And how complicated are each of these neural models? Like what architecture they use and how sort of, how many parameters they have, something like that. Very simple. Uh, right now we had very, very simple parameters. Uh, so for example, all the modules that do symbolic reasoning have no parameters in them. They only do, they only do some co computation in an expected manner. So like doing comparisons or maximum operations or addition subtraction requires no parameters at all. Because what you're doing is basically taking two distributions over numbers and computing a distribution over expected addition or something, which requires no parameters. The only parameters we have are in modules like find, filter, and extract argument. And those are just a single matrix. We do a token to token we compute a token to token similarity matrix kind of a thing. We learn that, which is, which is just a single matrix. Okay. Okay. And uh, so, so in the original drop data set, do they have these compositional questions available? Like uh, are, the, the, are the programs available? No, they, they do not have programs available. Um, so we heuristically, I heuristically found programs for this 10% of data. 
Okay. Uh, so you got it annotated like with crowdsourcing? No, no, no. Just just manually. So the there's a lot of repetition okay. in a drop as well. So you can do some regex finding and you can say that oh these questions will have oh, such a high level program. Okay. But there is this so, work called Break uh, from Jonathan Barand's group that came out in Tackle a couple of months back. They do some large scale um, question decomposition um, for a lot of different data sets. Um, drop is one of them. So like they have around 6,000 or 8,000 drop questions also. So you can look at that. Okay. Okay. And, so, and have, yeah. Have you, have you Go ahead. Uh, the sort of uh, this, this composition, these deep, smaller programs available on like with the code? Um, sorry. Uh, is the are these programs available with the code? Uh, yes. For, okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Um, yeah. If you are not able to exact, and then I don't think I have a list of these programs separately. Like there is some function that you can run, but if you cannot find them, just open up an issue in the code, and I can help you. Oh, good. Good. Thanks. Okay. So if anybody has other questions, they can obviously get in touch with Nitish and ask him. And I thanks again, Nitish, for this talk and taking this time. And I hope everybody enjoyed it. And if Nitish, you have feedback about this session, anything uh, critical or a good thing, you can always tell us and I will share them with the group. And I also take feedback from the uh, people and give it back to you. Uh, okay, sure. As no, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks. Yeah. Hopefully thanks it was for helpful you. for you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, okay, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Thanks. 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 All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.